Uh, this is um, Manya Bark, who has a great background, and Armenian genocide is very important. Thank okay. you. Thank you. So what I'm going to talk about today is the German connection to the Armenian genocide, and it's the German side of the story. I will get a little bit into the Armenian side, but it's primarily focusing on the German side. So it's about German knowledge and involvement in the Armenian genocide and what it would mean to Germany, a people that in 20 years would deliver onto the world stage um, a regime that would carry out the largest genocide in known history. So the genocide of the Armenian people was a Turkish genocide. Um, the German Empire as a state neither planned it um, nor actively encouraged it, although there were individual players um, on the scene that did encourage it. Um, and it also perhaps demanded it and encouraged it and at the least supported it. There were people within the, the German hierarchy that did support the genocide. Um, but Germany as a whole, as a nation, played a fatal role. They could have done something to stop it. They knew intimately the details as the genocide was unfolding. Um, and um, they, in that respect, they bear a co-responsibility for the genocide that took place in the Ottoman Empire. So I'm going to take you back a little bit. Um, and that's going back to Germany, the creation of Germany as a German state. So Germany was late into the great power game of European empire building and civilization and colonialization. And there were a number of reasons for that. First of all, Germany only formed its national conscience in respect to the um, Napoleonic Wars of Liberation, um, when Fa France under Napoleon had swept across Europe and invaded towards Russia. We all know that um, Napoleon ended up um, in a quagmire in Russia. And this was the first time that Ger the Germanic people started to form a consciousness of being German. Um, and this was relatively late, it was the 1870s. So with unification, um, Germany under the leadership of Otto von Bismarck, who was known as the Iron Chancellor because he was such a strong um, individual leader, um, formed uh, a new united Germany of all the different German um, uh, states in 1871. So by the unification, the new Germany became a political force to be reckoned with in Europe. Um, most of the foreign policy under Bismarck was about Germany's place within Europe. He was not particularly concerned about colonization, unlike the British, unlike the French, and unlike the Belgians. Um, and he kind of pushed back against any of the, um, the Kaisers that wanted to kind of, uh, kind of explore the idea of colonization, because they thought, if we're a break power, we need to have colonies. But Bismarck, for the most part, pushed back on that. Later on, though, he's kind of dragged kind of kicking and screaming a little bit into the idea of colonization of foreign, foreign powers. Um, one of the reasons that Germany was looking towards uh, colonization was for the uh, raw materials. Germany had become an industrial powerhouse and they needed raw materials. Now they lacked an army, they, I mean a navy. That, unlike Britain that had this fantastic navy that was well known, Germany did not. So in order to um, to kind of push back on the British who were you know, spreading their empire further and further, um, they needed to basically play catch up and stop the other European powers. And one way to do that was through the establishment of a connection with the Ottoman Empire. Most Germans at the time believed, and you would have found this across Europe, would have, be would have believed that colonial acquisitions um, were basically a litmus test for having achieved real nationhood. So for the Germans, we need to have a colony in order to be a great nation on the same stage as Britain and the same stage as France. So the Ottoman Empire was known as the sick man of Europe. Now the reason that they were considered the sick man of Europe was because their fortunes as an empire had been declining steadily from the 19th century. The economy had stagnated, their corruption was rampant, and the empire was in debt to European powers, primarily France and Britain. Um, the minorities within the Ottoman Empire, because the Ottoman Empire was not just Turkish, there were many different minorities amongst the, the Ottomans. You had Christians, you had, um, which were Greeks, Armenians, Slavs, and you also had a sizable Jewish population as well. 
The minorities were the ones that basically shouldered the, the taxation and the increasing taxation um, as a way of trying to pay off these debts. Um, but on the flip side, the minorities had no way or no representation of, um, and no way of, of um, you know, protecting themselves. They were pretty much at the mercy of the sultan. So non-Muslims in the Ottoman Empire were considered dimmi people. Um, and the, with the upper, um, Ottoman Empire waning and with pressure from European Christian powers, the Ottoman Empire was basically forced to make concessions towards the dimmis. Now, they were pretty sneaky about this. They did put forth some reforms in 1839 and in 1856. However, they still preserved the status quo of the Dimi people. So basically, they still remained the people at the bottom, even though supposedly there were reforms. So this is Sultan Abdul Hamid II, and he said, the way to get rid of the Armenian question is to get rid of the Armenians. He had successfully um, uh, started pogroms against the Armenians, and um, with the pogroms, taken a lot of their wealth. The Armenians um, kind of filled that middle group um, of merchants and traders. And um, in that respect, they were you know, the doctors and the lawyers. So they were more, more or less wealthy compared to the Turks, who made up the bulk of the peasant population. So that he had successfully robbed them and also killed them in pogrom-like uh, massacres. So the Ottomans, um, Armenians, by this time, are pretty familiar with Turkish brutality. So there were a number of massacres, um, and we're talking large-scale massacres, that occurred in the mid-1890s, again under Abdul Hamid II, the butcher. Um, it is estimated uh, that 100,000 to 300,000 were massacred in that time. Most of the figures hover around 200,000, which is a huge amount of, of the population. There was an international outcry, especially from the United States, and um, calls to have the Sultan be removed from his position. Um, also international forces, um, particularly the Quakers and the Methodists, um, mobilized to give aid to the Armenians. So in 1908, Sultan Hamid II was disposed, deposed of by his younger and more timid brother, who was known as Mehmed V, and he was installed as the new Sultan. But really, the real power lay behind the hands of Mehmed Talat, or he's known, more commonly known as Talat Pasha, who was one of the leaders of the Young Turks. The Young Turks were basically a, um, a revolutionary movement that wanted to establish a more, at the time, democratic um, power. So they wanted to re-establish the parliament. However, later on, things began to shift. So you had basically three main players, meaning Mahmoud Talat, um, and also Ishmael Enver, who is also known as Enver Pasha, and um, one other, which his name was um, Jamil Pasha. So after the 1908 revolution, again, there was another kind of massacre against the Armenians in relation to that revolutionary period in, in the Ottoman Empire. So some Armenians were actually supportive of the young Turkish movement. The reason they were um, supportive of it was because they saw this as a chance, if we're going to have a parliament, that we will have representation as minorities. And indeed, some um, Armenians were given um, positions in the parliament, were voted in for the parliament. So at the very beginning, the um, young Turkish movement looked like it might be inclusive of minorities and be a better um, situation than being under the Sultan, who had been obviously very anti-Armenian. However, what happened was that the CUP, which is the Committee of Union and Progress, became increasingly nationalistic, especially under the three Pashas. It's been suggested that Talat Pasha, as early as 1909, had written um, a thesis where he talked about wanting to eliminate the Armenians. So this is something that's already been um, in, in the thinking of a lot of, um, a lot of Ottomans, of, of Turkish Ottomans. So um, basically it became increasingly uh, nationalistic using um, Turkish symbols for the movement. So once the nationalists, those three Pashas, gained control of the CUP, um, the platform became basically a nationalistic one in which the Armenians, the Greeks, the Jews found themselves with less and less and less of a voice. 
Now we go back to Germany. So Kaiser Wilhelm II and his Weltpolitik, meaning his world politics, and his growing interest in the Orient. So why was Germany interested in the Middle East? So there's a number of reasons why Germany was interested in the Middle East. One was that there had always been this cultural interest in the Middle East um, since the 18th century. Kaiser Wilhelm II actually made two state visits to the Ottoman Empire and the Sultan in 1889 and in 1898. Um, actually, in the middle of when the Sultan Hamid II was massacring um, uh, the Armenians, he sent a signed photograph um, to Abdul Hamid. So the relationship was relatively close. The Kaiser basically said, we need Mesopotamia. Again, the idea that we need to have a colony um, to, to um, push our aims of being a world pa dominant power. And while on his visit to the Ottoman Empire, while he was actually in Damascus, he stated, we are the friends of Muslims for all times. And then while he was in Jerusalem, he declared, I certainly would have turned Mahatmatan, which means he would have, if he wasn't a Christian, he would have converted to become a Muslim. And soon after that, he styled himself as Haji Wilhelm. So unlike the French or the British that were pushing a Christian agenda, Wilhelm II was um, actually uh, courting the Muslims in the Middle East. Also, the Middle East offered vast economic opportunities. So while um, the Kaiser is on his tour to the Ottoman Empire, there's also um, different groups that are following along too. So you have um, uh, uh, Krupp's engineering, you have Mauser, the uh, um, weapons manufacturer, and you have other groups that are following along with the um, Kaiser's entourage in order that they um, put down uh, routes and make um, business arrangements within the Ottoman Empire. So it was not just a Kaiser meeting another uh, relative on the, on the same level, it's also an economic push or an ec economic exploration to, to gain a, a foothold in the Middle East. So here's a picture of the Kaiser, who's his first visit to Constantinople, which is now Istanbul. I'm still using the old as it was then at the time. So part of this exploration is the Baghdad Bahn, um, which was the Berlin to Baghdad Railway. Um, and it became the economic lifeline to the Middle East. Without rail, we didn't have, well, you had cars, but not to the same extent as you do here. So the rail became the, the link, um, kind of like the air, airplanes of today. Um, so basically, um, it was a crucial component of industrial and commercial development for the Middle East. So Germany, in its rush to become a world power, believed that the uh, Baghdad Bahn would actually facilitate this, this goal. So in addition to opening up the new markets um, in the Middle East, um, it would also act as a defensive measure against Russian and British dominance in the region. You have Russia above Turkey, and you have British in, in the Middle East, in the Suez Canal in Egypt, and um, North Africa, so really what the, the Germans are trying to do is kind of cut off um, any further movement for the British and the, um, the Russians in particular. So the Baghdad Bahn became basically the, the most important investment of Germany before World War I, and it was actually supported financially by the Deutsche Bank, which is one of the biggest banks in Germany. And it will have its implications during the Holocaust as well. So the success um, for future German expansion in the Middle East really depended on the success of this Baghdad Bahn. And also, incidentally, this railway would s slice not only through Europe, but also through Turkish and Armenian lands. As you can see through this map. It's going through all the way through Vienna, Hungary. So the German military mission to the Ottoman Empire was another important step in their um, alliance with, with Turkey. So the Prussian-Ottoman military relations go back into the 18th century. However, they weren't particularly successful because the Ottomans weren't really ready to relinquish much control to the, to the German officers. So it was limited in its success in, in, uh, in revitalizing the Ottoman army. But after Ottoman... Um, significant losses during the Balkan Wars, 
the, a request was made by the Sultan and Enver Pasha, who incidentally had been in Germany as a, um, as a military attache in Berlin for a number of years prior to this. And he had seen how Germany worked, and he was very impressed with the orderliness and, and how things were, were done in Germany. So he basically put an appeal to the German Kaiser and said, listen, we, 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 need, we need your help. We need to reorganize the, uh, the Ottoman Empire and the Ottoman army. So basically, uh, a German um, military commission was set up in order to basically modernize the Ottoman army from the ground up. In sheer numbers, it was huge. 25,000 German soldiers reached the Ottoman Empire over the course of the First World War. 800 served directly in the Ottoman army as part of the German military mission, and 12,000 were deployed in Turkey during the war. One of the, um, the uh, nice things that they gave the German officers was that if they went to Turkey, um, they were actually um, promoted one level up. So that was their compensation for being in the Ottoman Empire. So Germany helps to provide the ideological foundations for the massacres. So if you were here last week, you would have heard um, Dean Pearl talk about eugenics. So again, we're talking about eugenics here. So traditionally, Turkish anti-Armenian um, sentiment was primarily based on religious intolerance and economic envy. Like I said, during the first massacres, they were basically dispossessing the Armenians of their wealth and taking it into the state, as well as massacring Armenians. And they also feared um, that the Armenians would want um, autonomy because there were different, at that time, there were a lot of nat um, minorities agitating um, for their own autonomy, not just in Turkey, but across Europe. I mean, we've all heard about the assassination of Grand Duke Ferdinand. That was, again, you know, Serbians agitating for autonomy. So this was, this was a political movement that was basically spanning across Europe into the Middle East. So they were afraid that the Armenians would want autonomy. However, now with Germany, Germanians basically well entrenched in the Ottoman Empire, they actually exported from Germany a new brand of intolerance, which is racial stereotyping and eugenics. So it was fairly common within the German military class and also the ruling class um, that the Armenians were an inferior race. Um, and they also believed that this, the inferiority of the Armenians was hindering their own um, push into the Middle East. So Edvald Banza believed that the Im Armenians should be eliminated from the face of the earth, while Friedrich Neumann stated that Armenians are racially weaker than the Turks and the weaker nation must succumb. This has been stated in the early 1900s. So Friedrich von von Schellendorf, the chief of staff with the German military um, mission, stated that the Austrians, and I mean the Armenians, are nine times worse than the Jews. He was a rabid racist anti-Semite, and it's probably no surprise that he would later actually be a, a main supporter of the Nazi party. Also, um, they introduced the idea of ethnic stereotyping, um, and they basically developed the idea, the Germans developed the idea, that the Armenians were actually the Jews of the Orient, and sucking the blood of the Ottoman economy. So ger the German officer corps, which is traditionally anti-Semitic, racist, and conservative, accepted the idea that the Armenians were a negative force. So couple those two ideas between traditional Turkish anti-Armenian sentiment with the new eugenic ideology coming from Germany, and basically you have um, a combined lethal form of hatred. This is von Schellendorf, who is a military advisor. The Armenian is just like the Jew, a parasite outside the confines of his homeland, sucking the marrow of the people of the host country. Year after year, they abandon their native land, just like the Polish Jews who migrate to Germany to engage in usurious activity. Hence, the hatred which, in the medieval form, has unleashed itself against them as an unpleasant people, entailing their murder. So the idea of removing the Armenians had already been voiced before World War I. You had uh, basically um, scientists of, of uh, various varieties that believed in um, and using the Armenians. One of them, his name was Paul Raulbach, and he introduced the idea of removing the Armenians en masse and resettling them in Mesopotamia. 
And he believed this not so much as a, a negative against the Armenians, but he believed that the Armenians were actually a very industrious force and a force to be reckoned with. The reason that he believed that they were an industrious force was because, as I mentioned before, they were the, um, the doctors, the lawyers, and the merchants. So they were the ones that were the powerhouse of any kind of economy. And if Germany was to expand into the Orient and into the Middle East, who did you need to help you start up your economy? You needed those industrious people. So his idea was you're going to move them from Turkey into Mesopotamia, where Germany wanted to have more influence. And therefore, they would help the German economy build itself up in Mesopotamia. And this wasn't just an idea that was applied to the Armenians. Um, we said next a couple of weeks that we're going to talk about the African um, genocides. The same thing was applied by the Germans in their colonies in, in Africa as well. It was this idea that um, minorities or other people are expendable. So you had many within the German establishment, both um, within the um, army as well as um, in industry, that believed that these people were expendable for their own benefit. So this uh, general, Komar von Goltz, whose name by the uh, Turks was Goltz Pasha, and the reason he got that name was because he was so highly regarded by the Turks. Not anybody could become a Pasha. So he was the advisor to the Ottoman Empire. He believed in uprooting and relocating, and he believed this in military terms. Um, he believed that they would be a, a threat to the Ottomans, and they were a subversive element. So he wanted them removed from the outlying areas of the Ottoman Empire and resettled south in Syria or Mesopotamia, where they would no longer be a threat. There's also some evidence that during the war, the First World War, that he gave explicit orders that Armenians working on that Berlin Baghdad Bahn, that they should be deported. And during that time, deportation meant certain death. So he is credited with persuading the Sultan to try and end the Armenian question once and for all. So now we come to the eve of World War I. So the Turks also had their own imperialistic uh, dreams. Under the le leadership of Enver Pasha and Talat Pasha, a new Turkish nation was to be created which would stop the collapse of the Ottoman Empire, which was crumbling, and bolster Turkish power by pushing eastward through Armenia, you can see Armenia's that yellow dot, um, to reunite the Turkic people of Central Asia and Turkey. So this kind of idea of bringing home all the Turkic people, which we will hear again later on during the Second World War, when you hear about bringing back the Germanic people and all the Volksdeutsch under one Germanic people, that same idea is already been manifested by the Turks 25, 26 years earlier, that they're wanting to bring all the Turkic people under Turkish rule. So Turkey and Imperial Germany entered a military agreement which guaranteed that there would be a German chief of staff in every Turkish army division. That's huge. So basically, troop movements and strate strategic decisions and planning would be made and approved by the German in command, not by the Turk in command, but by the German in command. So Turkish-German military alliance, a catastrophe for the Armenians. This is Goltz Pasha, the German, with some Turkish military officers. So war, just like in the Second World War, it becomes a cover for genocide. So war for the, um, the Ottoman Empire was a little later than for the rest of Europe. They entered the war on the 31st of October, 1914, about two months later than Europe. Within 31 days um, or of them entering the war, the um, first massacres began. And they began in the outer lying provinces that basically buffered Russia. So in a lot of these towns and villages, any male over the age of 10 was marked for execution. So it wouldn't be long before they would actually then start targeting those that were left behind, the women, the children, and the old people. So the news of these, um, these massacres was already kind of filtering back, back to Constantinople. And um, there were a number of um, Ottomans that then kind of beseeched the um, Pasha that these massacres should be stopped. However, they weren't. 
he basically said, nope, and he actually created what they called a special organization, which is akin basically to the Einsatzgruppen that will be used against European Jews, or particularly Eastern European Jews during World War II. And it's interesting that these same kind of euphemisms are used during the Armenian genocide as that are used in during the Holocaust. So they were set up quickly, and most of the, the uh, members of these special organizations were career criminals who had been let out of jail and who were known for their brutality, murder, rape, and so forth. So these are the ones that are tasked with carrying out attacks against um, the Armenian people. And the idea behind this was that, like Galt's Pasha, the Armenians too were basically stating, at least two of the Pasha, Enver and Talat, was that the Armenians were a suspect people. Because the Armenians were Christian, they were not Muslim, and they had a, Armenian brothers and sisters in Russia. In the first months of the war, quite often there were Armenians on the Turkish side fighting their Armenian relatives on the Russian side of the border. So they be began to propagate this idea that the Armenians were suspect, that you couldn't trust them. They were probably going to go over to the Russian side or they were going to attack Turks within, um, within the Ottoman Empire. So there was this idea then that was really promoted that the Armenians were therefore um, to be looked at in a, in a suspicious way. Despite their appeals, the Armenian appeals to the Talat that these massacres stop, um, they then saw that that was getting them nowhere, so they knew the relationship between the Germans and the Armenians, and they sought reassurances from the German missions that were already established and diplomatic um, houses that were throughout the Ottoman Empire. So Hans Freiherr von Wagenheim, he was the German ambassador in Constantinople. He actually refused to help. He knew what was going on. He'd had reports from um, other diplomats, German diplomats within the provinces, so it wasn't like he didn't know to the extent of, of what was happening in these provinces. Partly why he uh, refused to acknowledge what was going on or to give them help was because he too saw the Armenians as vermin. He actually told the US ambassador Henry Morgenthau, I shall do nothing whatsoever for the Armenians. As soon as the word was out that von Wagenheim was not going to help the Armenians, the Turks began to arrest um, Armenian intellectuals and community leaders. Over 300 of them were arrested, and kind of uh, reminiscent of Katyn, where the Soviets actually massacred all Polish intellectuals and military officers. These 300 uh, Armenian lawyers, doctors, uh, priests, um, anyone who had uh, any standing in the community was massacred. And this was in the big city of Constantinople. So it, it wasn't missed. People then knew across Europe what was going on. So under the cover of the British and Anzac campaign to um, take control of the Dardanelles in the Battle of Gallipoli, you've probably seen some films about the Battle of Gallipoli, the Turks began their deportation of other Armenians and other Armenian intellectuals and leaders from Constantinople on the very railway that the Germans had created, that Deutsches Bagdadbahn. So they were deported to their deaths. Once the Allies failed to take Gallipoli in um, January 1916, the Turkish government, or the, under the three pashas, became emboldened. They thought, well, we've got away with it. We've beaten the, the Anzac forces. We've beaten the British. This is it. We can go. So what happened one then was that they embarked on the, a bolder plan to eliminate the Armenian people, men, women, and children, basically two million people through massacre and deportation. So this became the massive uprooting of the Armenians was along the same plans that had been suggested earlier by some German scientists. Again, let's uproot a whole people and move them to Mesopotamia and Syria. However, there was no intention by the Armenians of moving them and settling them anywhere. This was moving them to their deaths. There were no supply chains, there was no, no, um, no housing, no, no anything. And when, just before the deportation orders were sent out, they would have a town crier go into the village or the town and demand and say, within 24 hours, you're going to be deported. What they also demanded was itemized lists of everything that the Armenians owned. Also sounds reminiscent of something else during the Holocaust. So they, again, kind of uh, um, gave the Armenians a false sense of hope by saying, 
if you have this much in property and it's worth this much money, at the end of your journey, we'll um, compensate you for what we have here. It was all a lie. So how far would Germany go to assist the, their Turkish allies? Would they actually assist Turkey in removing the Armenians? So German mili the mi military mission and the ambassadors and anti-Armenian violence. So von Wagenheim, that same one that said he wasn't going to assist the uh, Armenians, cabled Berlin stating that deportations were being conducted by the Turks for military considerations. Basically, he's agreeing with Talat Pasha that the Armenians needed to be deported for military reasons, that they couldn't be trusted. And he stated that as such, because it's for a military reason, that the, uh, the policy was also in the interest of Germany. Von Schellendorf, that lovely um, gentleman who is quite the racist, was one of the highest ranking German officers in Turkey. And he was also effectively um, Enver Pasha's second in command. He also called for the Armenians of the six provinces, the major six provinces, to be dealt with harshly. He gave his approval to Talat's um, deportation by issuing his own deportation order um, on July 25th, a couple of um, months later than the one by Talat. But the fact that he would actually issue his own deportation order is really significant, that, and that he would sign his name to it. He also noted that Armenian soldiers that were demoted into labor battalions should be deported and tre treated with severe measures. Um, what had happened was uh, after, when, when Germany started to reorganize the Ottoman Empire's army, um, anyone that was a, a minority also had to serve in the Ottoman army. But what happened was within the first few months of the war, Armenians that had been drafted into the Ottoman Empire were then seen as suspect. So they were demoted out of the army into labor battalions. Also significantly, a call went out amongst the provinces that all Armenians should surrender any personal weapons that they have. So Schellendorf then also utilizes the same code words that Talat Pasha was using for massacre and extermination, which were severe measures. Lieutenant Colonel Sievert, who was also from the German military command, um, oversaw military um, Turkish intelligence, which was no known as Department Number no. 2. Also encouraged Enver Pasha to expand the special organizations, or killing squads. The special organizations were, who organized the genocide and were supplies, and were supplied by Department 2, which is headed by Germans. All operations were arranged by that same department. So as you can see that the Germans are implicitly involved in those special organizations. On July 7th, 1915, von Wagenheim confirmed that the Turkish government is trying to exterminate the entire Armenian race. Now this seems like it's a bit of an about turn for von Wagenheim, however it's not. Word had already reached the rest of the world, including the United States, especially as, um, the, as Morgenthau was very, very um, upfront about trying to stop the Armenian genocide. So really, the Germans were basically trying, under von Wagenheim, the diplomat, were trying to basically cover, their, um, cover themselves so that they're, again, kind of shifting the blame to the, to the Turks and kind of taking the blame off themselves and their own involvement. Therefore, you see these cables going back and forth that Turkey is trying to eliminate and exterminate the Armenian race. However, quietly behind the scenes, um, it's kind of like the nod, nod, wink, wink between the Turks and the Germans that, yes, we've officially said this, but we're not expecting you to take any measures to stop those, those massacres. So news was leaking out about the massacres. And there were a number of German missionaries that were completely aghast at what was happening. And they actually um, sent um, appeals back to the German government asking for things to be, for this genocide to be looked at carefully and for Germany to do something to stop it. So 
it's not like this was, was unknown, that they didn't know what was going on. They had people, probably the Germans more than anybody else, had more people on the ground giving written statements and witnesses to the, to the genocide. So they had first-hand knowledge. So Karl Liebknecht, who would later found the, the KPD party, the German Communist Party, was one of those individuals that was extremely alarmed as, as to what was going on. So he appealed to the German Chancellor, Bertmann Hollweg, on December 20th, 1915. So this is relatively early on. This is a year after the war has really started. The letter was an attempt to learn how much the German government actually knew um, and was aware of the massacres um, by the Turks and what they were going to do about it. So in response, the 26th session of the 13th Convocation of the Reichstag was tabled for this issue. But predictably, it was basically um, thrown out. Uh, Liebnik was told basically to be quiet and shut up and sit down. And they basically pushed the whole um, question aside and, and uh, ignored the whole issue. Even though there were Germans who were wanting to know and wanting to know what Germany was going to do about it because of the relationship between Germany and the Ottoman Empire. So now that it's already been tabled in front of the Reichstag, Germany has to respond in some way. So they basically adopt a policy of Gedankengang, which is known as a train of thought towards the mass deportation and massacre of the Armenians. So when Max von uh, Schubner Richter, who was the German vice consul to Erzum, disputed the official Turkish and German um, uh, 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 reports, especially von Wagenheim, he's writing reports as well. So um, Richter, he actually um, questions those reports. And he says that what the, the Armenians are being charged with, with being like a, a fifth column, is actually incorrect. It's not true. So General Schellendorf objected to Richter, and Wagenheim also responded by saying the Armenians have started the trouble themselves. The Ottoman government was protecting them. A lot of doublespeak there. So this argument was eventually called Gedankengang, and it became the official German policy in regards to the massacres. So not only did the German government deny that the Armenian genocide was happening, but they actually formulated the first major denialist argument that's actually still used today by the Turkish government. So Germany had a direct benefit from the official line of denial in which it diminished their own culpability and responsibility and participation in the genocide. So the German uh, uh, foreign office in Berlin the state undersecretary, Arthur Zimmermann, ordered the fabrication, this is like mass propaganda, fabrication of reports that would show that the Armenians were treasonable and guilty. So basically, it was, um, yeah, quite, quite something about, uh, what, what's the word that we use today? Fake news, fake news yes. <laughs> so Germany is one of the first originators of fake news. And so really, the, the Armenian vict victims are denounced twice. Um, they're denounced by the Turks, and they're denounced by the Germans, and their, their deaths are, are basically made into something that is fake news. So this is the German ambassador in Constantinople. This is the von Wagenheim. I do not blame the Turks for what they are doing to the Armenians. They are entirely justified. So when you have the top German diplomat stating that the Turks are justified in the extermination of the Armenian people. The Turks are not going to uh, do anything to stop those massacres. So now we get to the role of the Baghdad Ban. So for the first time in history, you're actually seeing um, that a railway would actually expedite deportation and massacres of civilians. You will see that again during the Second World War. So basically, the railway had become a means for wholesale mass extermination of the Armenians towards the Syrian deserts. Franz Gunther, who was actually um, an official in charge of uh, the Baghdad Bahn, and he was actually with the Deutsches Bank, he was one of the few people that actually was aghast at what was happening to the Armenians, as it was happening right under his nose. So he sent a report to his superiors in Berlin and in it, he was denouncing what was happening to the Armenians and, and denouncing the deportation and demanding that something be done for the Armenian people. He described in it how more than 800 old people, men, women, and children, were rounded up, 
and forced into freight wagons. There was no answer, so he sent another telegram. And in it, he sent photographs titled, The Bearers of Culture in Turkey. The Armenians were known as the bearers of culture, musicians, artists, poets, and incredibly cultured and intellectual people. So these are our so-called sheep wagons. 880 persons are transported in just 10 wagons. Remind you of something. Not only was the railway used, but the deportations were centrally organized. Timetables were kept, and uh, the trains were kept running on time. Lists were made of which towns were emptied of the Armenian inhabitants and when they left, how many, where they were sent to, and what percentage of the total population they constituted. Talat Pasha was known to have a telegraph machine in his own home, and he would demand that the different provinces report back to him daily as to what, what was going on with the deportation of the Armenians and how many were left. The Turkish and German alliance eventually began to fray. Why did it fray? Not because of what the Germans saw as the disgusting treatment of the Armenian people, but rather because the Germany, Germany wanted to see the railway used to transport military equipment, and it was being clogged up by the transportation of human beings. So then you started to see a fracture within the German um, and Turkish alliance. Also, the Armenians, many of them were forced to assist in the completion of the railway. There was a chunk of railroad that had been incomplete, and the German engineers were furiously trying to complete the, the, the track in order that they reach all the way to Baghdad without having to unload and use wagons to then get to the next point. So a lot of them were used um, as slave labor, basically, um, to finish this railway track. But what they didn't know was that this railway was actually basically hastening the deaths of their fellow compatriots. So here are some of the pictures that, um, that uh, Gunter took of the Armenians packed into cattle tracks. And on this picture, this is, this is one that he sent. And you can see there it says 40 ohms, which is uh, 40 men. <coughs> But you can see in there, there's definitely more than 40 people in, in, that, in that one there. So this is where the railway is cut in two. And you'll see the forcible slave labor of Armenians to complete that track. And that was under German engineer supervision. These are some of the um, slave labor, Armenian slave labor on the railway. Here's a map of the major concentration camps and deportation routes. So you can see how extensive the railway and deportation routes are. There were 25 concentration camps for the Armenians, which is really quite staggering. And here you can see Armenia, and the, um, the red dots represent the size of the population that was exterminated. So direct complicity was known at the time by the Turks and by the Armenians. So there was a colonel called Colonel Botrich. He headed the military commission, which also composed a memorandum which was to act as a guideline. It was never completed, but it was the guideline for the deportation and special measures for Armenian railway personnel. So not only did they have to serve as slave labor, but when they were no longer able to work on the railway, they were to also be deported to their deaths. And that was set up by Colonel Botrich. Some German officers were also directly involved in murdering individual Armenians. And this was witnessed by Armenian survivors as well as Turkish soldiers under um, the officer's command. Another German officer is reported by Armenian survivors as having pushed 22,000 Armenians into a valley and ordered the Turkish soldiers to kill them. He also is alleged to have taken part in the killing. During the siege in Urfa, which is present-day Syria, of course, the Ottoman Empire extended all the way into Syria, the um, Armenians in that area had 
had been made aware of what was happening to their fellow Armenians. And also they had seen the, the Armenians that had been pushed into the desert and they were trying to aid them. They then decided that they had to fight back. So they um, basically tried to... It was a siege situation where Urfa was under siege for a number of days. The Turks weren't able to penetrate Urfa because of the resistance by the Armenians. So they asked the Germans to send in reinforcements. So Germany agreed to send in reinforcements, including 75 millimeter howitzers. These are the big berthas, as they were known during World War I, the one that you know almost managed to, uh, well, they actually did hit Paris during the First World War. And in charge of this, this uh, battalion was a Major Eberhard Graf Woodskill, who personally led the attack against the Armenians. So many German officers witnessed or were directly involved in the massacres and wrote about their massacres to their families back home in Germany. So we actually have diary reports of German officers talking about the massacres of the Armenians and their participation in it. This is from um, Eberhard Wuskill. He wrote back to his wife, when our artillery fire struck the houses and killed many people inside, the others tried to retreat into the church itself, but they had to go around the church across the open church courtyard. Our infantry had already reached the houses to the left of the courtyard and shot down the people fleeing across the church courtyard in piles. All in all, the infantry which I used in the main attack acquitted itself very well and advanced very dashingly. Um, I don't know what happened there, but here you can see German and Turkish officers posing in front of the skulls of Armenian victims. The German Reich provided the weapons to carry out the genocide. Like I said, those first two exploratory trips by the Kaiser were also about economics. So the Turkish forces mainly used German rifles and other weapons to carry out the genocide of the Armenians. Mauser supplied the Ottoman Empire with millions of rifles and handguns. German officers were also equipped with, um, German, with Mauser rifles or carbines, and the officers had Mauser pistols. The Turkish army was also equipped with hundreds of cannons, which were produced by Krupp, which were used against the Armenian resistance fighters, especially at Musa Dag Mountain in 1915. Kolmar van Goltz, that same Goltz Pasha, boasted that without me, rearmament of the army with German models would not have happened. So also, in order for the uh, Turks to know how to work the weapons, they needed to be trained by Germans on how to use these weapons. The world will always hold Germany responsible. The guilt of these crimes will be your inheritance forever. I do not claim that Germany is responsible for these massacres in the sense that they instigated them, but she is responsible in the sense that she had the power to stop them and did not use that. That was by Henry Morgenthau, the, Germ um, the U.S. ambassador to the German ambassador Wagenheim. Incidentally, Wagenheim's um, replacement, Wagenheim actually died of a stroke um, and he was replaced by a, um, another um, general, Metternich. And Metternich, unlike his predecessor, was constantly cabling um, Berlin, demanding that Berlin do something to stop the massacres. It's no surprise that the Ottomans demanded that Berlin recall Metternich from his position as ambassador. So post-war exile of Turkish perpetrators in the German debate. As we all know, Germany and Turkey lost the war. But Turkish perpetrators of the genocide escaped with the help of German generals and diplomats. Talat was actually um, escaped with the use of a German submarine back to Berlin. And they were all given sanctuary in Germany. The British held war tri crimes trials, and they, the three Pashas were tried in absentia and convicted. But German authorities, which kind of shows you the sense of guilt or responsibility that they had, were concerned that they would be held accountable for the genocide. So in 1919, a Dr. Otto Kopert, who was the chief military advisor to the German Foreign Office, was concerned about German financial responsibility, meaning reparations, resulting from the genocide. 
So already they're trying to create the argument to release them of their responsibility because they were afraid that they would have to pay reparations for their own involvement in the genocide. We have now more fake news. <laughs> The German Foreign Office in 1919 started to quickly publish a collection of diplomatic correspondences in an attempt to fend off accusations of complicity. And this was done before the Paris Treaty, Peace Treaty, which is the Treaty of Versailles, because they were worried that if their complicity in the genocide was known, they would be dealt more harshly by the, by the, the victors um, during the Versailles Treaty. So instead of quietening the debate, it actually kicked off a, a debate um, whether this was murder of a nation or annihilation of the Armenians. So it was discussed in the newspapers in 1919, 1920, fervently. There were a lot of returning soldiers to and officers coming back. And um, this became part of the debate to the point where the Nazi Party too um, was included in part of this debate. They started um, internalizing some of those arguments that had been used. So it's probably no surprise that Talat was actually assassinated in Berlin in 1921 by an Armenian, Sogomon, and I will not even try to pronounce his last name, in Operation Nemesis. This was a group of Armenians that formed an operation or, or a group to assassinate those that had been involved in the Armenian genocide. So it, it, it's interesting that because of the public debate that was being held in Germany at the time, he was actually acquitted of the murder by a 12-man jury in just two days. So that was how much public sentiment in Germany was in favor of Talat's assassin. So basically, um, the public debates continued until 1923, and after that, they kind of receded into the background. So among the Turks, this is from an American um, medical missionary. She said, among the Turks and the Armer Armenians, both it seems to be pretty much well known that this thing, um, the Armenian ma massacres, is from the Germans. We all know that such clear-cut, well-planned, and well-carried-out work is not the method of the Turk. The German, the Turk, and the devil make a triple alliance, not to be equaled in the world of cold-blooded hellishness. I'm going to show you some pictures, uh, perfect, pretty graphic. These are of Armenian intellectuals. This is by um, Max von Schumer Richter wrote this. He was the German vice consul. He was the one that spoke out against the massacres initially. But he also has his own involvement. Um, and he actually will become a supporter of the Nazi party. During the uh, putsch, the failed beer hall putsch, he will be one of the ones that takes the bullet for Hitler and dies. But incidentally, he was um, uh, a supporter of the Armenians. So he said, he was talking about a, um, a meeting um, of the CPU um, and what came out of that. He said, the first item on the agenda concerns the liquidation of the Armenians. Local incidents of social unrest and acts of Armenian self-defense will be deliberately provoked and inflated and will be used as pretext to affect the deportations. Once en route, however, the convoys will be attacked and exterminated by Kurdish and Turkish brigands, brigades, sorry, and in part and by gendarmes. So this, in this picture, you can see the male Armenians being deported. So any defense of women and children is basically going to be non-existent. These are women and children now being deported. And this is an interesting quote. By continuing the deportation of the orphans to their destinations during the intense cold, we are ensuring their eternal rest. This is Talat Pasha. We'll remind you probably of the um, sign over Auschwitz that says, Arbeit macht frei. Work will bring you freedom. Here he's ensuring their eternal rest. This is to show you how much was known in Germany at the time. This is a contemporary German report in a newspaper. And the translation from the German newspaper states, crucified Armenian women in the area of Der Elzor, 
Some women were saved. Seen here in the picture, you can see that um, one woman has been carried off on like, it looks like a donkey, by Arab Bedouins who took them down from the crosses. Most weren't that lucky. This will show you just a snapshot of the horror. The picture to the right, you would quite easily mistake it for being 1942. Who, after all, speaks today of the annihilation of the Armenians? Adolf Hitler, 1939. Thank you. Any questions? Yes. They say a third of the population. Uh, no, two million. But the, the population of Armenians that did survive were mostly in Russia, Armenia, Russian Armenia. No, no, that, yes, yes, yeah, yes. So my husband and my son are both survivors, uh, descendants of survivors of the Armenian genocide. And my father-in-law, until his death in 2012, it would have been his greatest wish to hear the word genocide when describing the situation. And he did not live to hear the United States acknowledge that. And we, given our relationships with Turkey, it's still unlikely. So um, I just wanted to ask, uh, in today in Germany, how is this story told in the, in the schooling system? In the Bundestag in 2015, the German government publicly acknowledged their responsibility to the genocide, and they called it a genocide. It caused a big uh, diplomatic war with um, Turkey, um, which really hasn't really been healed since, um, but then given the Erdogan in Turkey, one wouldn't expect that. Um. I just want to say also, too, there's a saying that is when you hear an Armenian laugh, it's because he knows that he survived. And that's something that they say to each other. So. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. I have a question. Just speaking of the situation drawing parallels to the situation now in northern Syria, do you feel that, and obviously it's a much smaller scale, but do you fear that there's a fear? of this same kind of fate for the Kurdish people? And do the Turkish people still have this ideology of uh, Turkish superiority? And is this something that's maybe driving around? I mean, I think Erdogan is definitely somebody who's promoting that, and he has been for years. Um, if you talk to Turkish people, a lot of them that come and study in the West, I mean, you, you hear that in Germany. I mean, I can talk from my own German experience. Um, a lot of, there's a lot of Turks in Germany. So at university, you would find a lot of Turks surprised. They didn't even know. They weren't taught anything about the Armenian genocide in school. So when they're hearing it for the first time in the West, a lot of them are shocked. So given Erdogan's position and control of the state of Turkey for a long time, I would say that there has been even less knowledge um, that has been filtering in for a long time. Um, and really, I think it's only for Turks that are educated or have traveled abroad that would know about it. Um, and he's definitely been promoting a, a superiority of Turks and kind of agitating in some way, at least I believe he has, to create um, another Ottoman Empire. He sees himself as another Pasha, effectively. Um, and I do think that what's, and I think it's to America's shame what's happening in, in um, in, in uh, Syria right now. Some of his language about the Kurdish people, it just echoes some of these code words and things that... Oh, absolutely. He said things about total domination of the of Kurds. Absolutely. And he, using the same word, terrorists, they're terrorists, they're subversive elements. That, those same code words are being used again and again and again. But it's ironic because the, the Kurds during the Armenian um, genocide were those committing genocide against the Armenians. I mean, some of the stories that you hear, I mean, I'm not saying that 100% of them were, there were Kurds that actually saved Armenians, but on the whole, the Kurds were complicit in the annihilation of the Armenians. Um, and if they weren't complicit in uh, genocide, they were complicit in the rape 
and um, slavery of especially Armenian women. Um, they, they, I mean, you might, if, you, if you're interested, you can see um, photographs of Armenian women who have been tattooed across their face. Um, and this was because in, in Kurdish tribal regions, tattooing was part of um, identification as Kurd, as, the cultu as culturally Kurdish. So you will see these women basically, Armenian women branded um, by these, these, these Kurdish people too. So for the Armenian people, there's, there's a mixed response to, to, the, to the Kurds, but in a present day response, I can imagine that they, they see the parallels. Actually, Michelle and I, Michelle had read it too, um, a book by Chris Borjalian called uh, Sandcastle Girls. And um, I mean, you could see where one of the gentlemen, um, he was an engineer, forced to work on the railroad, and one of the women, her husband was killed. He was a doctor, you know, and, and it, it is very interesting. And after Hearing your presentation, and you know, obviously Mr. Bojalian Bojalian did tremendous research. Right. Because right. it, it speaks, you know, talks about the same things. Yeah. And there's a museum in Watertown. Yes. Yeah. I haven't been to it, but there is one. And if you ever get to Lebanon, there's actually a really, really good one in Jbail. Um, it's called the Armenian Orphans Museum, and they've done a fantastic job of presenting the, um, um, the, the orphan story um, and these children, what they had gone through, what they had witnessed. And it's a story of not only survival, but perseverance and how they were able to reclaim their lives. Mm -hmm. And the fact that they preserved their identity in Lebanon. Um, there's a sizable Armenian population in Lebanon. So as well as, I think California probably has the biggest in the United States. Yeah. Yes. Yes. In the beginning, you showed a map of the whole area of a country called Armenia. Yes. Is it still there? Um, there is a Republic of Armenia. Yes. Um, um, it was created out of the Soviet Union, um, but there is uh, there's there's uh, you probably know more than I do. But there's um, Eastern Aram, um, Armenian and Western Armenian, and in Arme the the country of Armenia, they speak. Eastern Armenian, not Western Armenian, and I guess there's quite a lot of difference between the two. So most of the survivors are Western Armenians. And also, too, in the church as well. They also support the, the Orthodox Armenian church as well, so there are differences. And so that people will ask, you know, it, it's, it's really telling. You see, like, a, an obituary in the, in the Boston Globe, what church somebody goes to tells you everything you need to know. It's very much like, oh, he's one of, you know, he's a Eastern or Western. <laughs> okay, thank you very much.